In this lesson, we're going to study how we can use polynomial functions to solve polynomial inequalities. So you're going to need your notes from 3.3 graphs of polynomial functions. We may have skipped this first example, but you should have some information already filled out from these other examples on the front page. We are going to be working today on the back, and so make sure you have this handout. Uh, pause the video again if you need to. Grab it and we'll get going. Okay, so our goal is to solve, well, I almost said equations. This is not an equation. We're gonna solve inequalities. We're gonna see, rather than our equal sign, it's gonna have a less than or a greater than symbol of some sort. And so our job is to solve the inequality. In order to understand this a little bit better, let's go look at the example we have on the front. And let me talk a little bit about this. Let's review quickly. Remember, what we did is we broke down pulling out the leading terms from each of the factors to figure out what our lead term would be of the whole polynomial. And from that, we were able to decide what the ends look like. Then we took each factor, individually set them equal to zero, and found three roots, one of them having a multiplicity of two. So it counts for a second root as well. And then we put our roots on our graph. And we started drawing based on the fact that we knew that the ends were both down. So we started here on the left end down. We came up and passed through this single intercept, made a turn so we could pass through the second intercept, and made a turn to head towards the last intercept, but this one was special with that double multiplicity, so we just bounced off of the x-axis there and headed right back down so that our end would be just as it was predicted. Now, how does this help us answer the question of an inequality? This is a graph of the polynomial function. What we need to know is when is this polynomial positive when is it negative? The way we express it is when is the polynomial less than zero? And opposite from that, when is the polynomial greater than zero? So when we have this analysis done where we have a graph to look at, we can really look at the parts of the graph that lie above the x-axis and compare those or contrast those with the parts that lie below the x-axis. So the part that's above the x-axis is any of this region. If the graph comes up in here, we know that the value has a y value up there of a positive. And on the other hand, end of it, any part of the graph that lies down here, this is the whole section of the graph where the y values or the function values are negative. So above the x-axis, the function is greater than zero. And below the x-axis, the function is less than zero. So if I want to know when my function is less than zero, for example, I'm just looking at these sections of the graph where I'm below the x-axis. So I could write my answer in interval notation. I could say this function is less than zero when x is in the interval from negative infinity up to negative three. And that would be this first part of the graph. It goes up into the positive values after that, but then it dips back down into the negative values between 0 and 1. So I would include that as an interval. And it actually ends in the negative values. So it goes from 1 to infinity. Now, I'm not including 1 itself because I'm specifying that the function is less than 0. But if that said or equal to, then I would just let this whole interval stand, and that would include the 1. Okay, now we can do this from a graph. It's actually pretty straightforward. But what I'd like to do is show you a number line method where you don't have the graph necessarily, but by drawing a number line that represents the x-axis and then specifying whether the function is positive or negative, you can still get the same picture. So it's gonna look something like this. I would put my negative three, my zero, and my one. So I'm gonna put these intercepts, x-intercepts on the number line. I'm gonna label the number line f of x. And rather than graphing it, I'm just going to say, is the function positive or negative in each of these four sections? And so I would look like this. The first part is negative. And then between negative 3 and 0, that's where I'm up into the positive sections up here. So I put a little positive. Between 0 and 1, the function is negative. And between 1 and on to infinity, it's negative. And at each of these points, I would indicate that the function is zero by putting a little zero along the line there. 
Okay, so this number line right here is kind of telling the same kind of thing this graph is, that it's below or above the x, the, yeah, the x-axis, depending on whether the function outputs are negative or positive. And this is the kind of technique that I'd like to do in our example. So let's go to the back, and let's do this first example. These are the kind of problems I'm going to ask you to solve. So my first step on this is to figure out what my x-intercepts are. And it's already factored, so I would just say this first factor, x is going to have to be negative 2 to make this factor be 0. That's one of my intercepts. The second factor, which is actually two of the same thing, is going to have a root at x equals uh, positive 1. I almost put negative 1, but that's positive 1. And that's a repeat factor, so here's where I'd want to make a note of the multiplicity, that that would count twice. If I was going to graph it, it would be a place where the graph just touches the x-axis. So I have my intercepts, and I want to put those on a number line. And this can represent the x-axis for you. So negative 2 and 1, and let me put my little times 2 as my reminder. This is, could normally be where I would draw my graph, but here I'm going to put little pluses and minuses on this number line. Okay, now before I'm ready to do that, I want to think about the ends of the graph, just as we've done before. So what do the ends of this graph look like? Let's get the lead terms from each factor, starting with this one. This is going to have x as a lead term. And the second factor is going to have x again, but we're going to square it with the power on the outside. So we have ends that behave the way an x cubed graph would. You'll remember that that means the ends start down and end up. OK, so here's the first indication of what I'm going to do on my number line. Is the first section of the graph above or below the x-axis? Well, you can see right here, the first section of the graph is below the x-axis. So the first part of my graph is taking negative values. It's coming from down here, and it's going to rise and hit this point. If I was drawing the graph, that's exactly what I would draw. It's going to hit this point where it would become a 0. And this is a cross-through point. So at that point, those negative values transition to being up here in the positive values. So I would indicate this interval is positive. Somewhere, those positives turn around and hit this 0 again. But this is a double 0. So this is a place where they would come from up here. They would turn and just touch that 0, and then they'd head right back up, which means this last part is positive as well. And that makes sense because remember what we said the end was going to look like. The right end is above the x-axis, so the right end of this interval should take positive values. Okay, so if you have a hard time seeing that, it's, it's helpful, especially at first, to kind of draw that graph. And it's not going to be a perfect graph, but it should kind of follow this idea. Starting in the negative values, hitting 0, crossing into the positives, turning and touching so it can go right back into the positives. That graph would look something like that. So I hope you can see the, the below and the above the axis corresponding to the negative when we're below and positive when we're above. OK, now to answer the question. The question is right here. When does this function have values that are less than 0? We all know less than 0 what that means. We mean when is the function negative, which is the same thing as less than 0. Oh, I just noticed that's equal to as well. So negative or 0, less than or equal to 0. OK, we have our answer in the number line. The function is less than or equal to 0 when the interval tested out as a negative interval, or when the graph is below the x-axis. So that's just this one section right there. So it would be from negative infinity until we come up to negative 2. And because we want to allow x to be equal, or sorry, let the function be equal to 0, we'll, we're, we're going to include the negative 2. There's one more place. So it's all of this including the negative 2, and there's one more place to include, and that's right here, because here's a point where the function value is 0, which we, we're allowing. So that interval and at x equals 1. This would be the solution to that inequality. Now, we apply this idea to do domain questions. Let me remind you for domain, especially when there's a radical involved, a square root in this case, that when you're taking that square root You've got a radicand under the square root. 
And that radicand right there must be positive, must be greater than zero. So that's the approach you're going to want to take to these. You're going to want to take the radicand part, just the radicand, pull it away, and say that it must be greater than zero. So these factors. I'm writing down my radicand, and I'm requiring it to be greater than zero. Now, can a square root be taken of zero? Is the square root of zero an actual value? It is. So let me back up and edit this a little bit. It must be greater than or equal to zero. So let's add that to our inequality here. Okay, now my approach is going to be just like it was above. Once I've pulled this out, I'm going to look for the zeros that I would put on my number line. So each of these factors is going to contribute one. We've got x is equal to 2. Here we have a double one. x is going to be negative 3. Put a multiplicity 2 on that. And x is equal to 1. These are the places where my graph is making transitions. So here on my number line, let's see, the first one would be the negative 3. Then 1 would come after that, and we would have the last one at 2. These are the places where my function is zero. Make a little note that those are all zeros. Okay, let's bring in the question of what the ends look like. At the very beginning, would this be positive or negative? And the other end of it, is this positive or negative? So for the ends, pull out your lead terms from each factor. First one will be an x, then an x squared. In the middle factor and finally an x. Altogether we're looking at x to the fourth power which puts the ends both up and that means that the beginning of your graph is up or in the positive value and the end of your graph is up or also in the positive range. So you can even just put those two ends in there right away. Okay now imagine yourself from up here coming down to this double root this is a place where you would just bounce off of it. So you wouldn't transition into negative, you would bounce and you'd go right back into positive. That means this interval is positive. So it starts positive, it bounces and goes right back into positive. Somewhere in there it's gonna turn and come to this root. And at that root it's gonna cross over into the negatives. This will be a negative interval where it will turn around and cross through again and it's gonna end up positive. Draw, if, you, if it helps you draw that in, your answer to this is the domain question. Wait, remember, it has to be giving us the positive or equal interval. So where is this function, either positive or equal to zero? I'm going to highlight those. That's going to be this interval, this interval, all of that, even the zero, and the last interval. So we're going to not include this part that's negative in our domain. All right, time to write my answer. So my answer is the domain is the intervals from negative infinity up to through and including the one that gets all of that. And the interval starting at two, including that hard bracket it all the way for forever with no limit. That's the domain. Okay, so that's the idea. You're looking for positive and negative, and you can use those roots as well as the ends to help you decide. Now, I've got to try this question for you, and I think that you ought to try pausing the video and just see if you can solve this, you and your, your uh, group people. Turn to your people and see if you can solve this equation, which I just showed you part of the answer. I didn't mean to do that, but oh well, here we go. Zero, four, double, and negative one, those are your roots, so I've already put them on the number line. And I've done the work for the ends. I'm just kicking myself because I did not mean to show you this. But I didn't do the whole thing. So you take it from there, pause the video, come back when you have, everybody's got an idea of an answer and I will run you through the rest of the solution. All right, hopefully you were able to get somewhere with this. What you wanna do is take your ends that are both in the upper part of the range, that means we've got positive range values, and I would indicate that the beginning of this graph is positive, and the end of this graph takes positive numbers. 
the switches happen each of these zeros. So if I'm coming from up here and I hit this zero across through, I'm into this negative region. So this interval is negative. Then I cross through back into this region, which is positive. And I hope that this makes sense right here. Why did I get positive on both sides of this? That's because it was positive to start with. It just turned around at that zero and went right back into positive. So for the solution to this, we look back at our original question, which was to list where the values are greater than zero. All right, so greater than zero, I am looking for positive only. I'm not including any of the zeros. Well, this graph is positive. We can see these intervals. It's positive here and it's positive here and here. So I've got two intervals, but I'm not including any of the ones that equal zero. This would be open and open. So my answer would be from negative infinity to negative one, not including the negative one. Put a soft parenthesis on it. And again, in this section from zero to four, not including those. And to make sure we don't include four in the next one, we start a new interval from four to infinity and we're not including the four. There's your solutions. Okay, you've got some in your homework to try. Give them a try. I wish you luck if you have any questions. Don't forget, you can always remind text me and I can try to help you out. Have a great one.